to talk now. We're very happy today to welcome Benyat Garajo Mendizava, <laughs> so I my pronunciation, um, a former SOAS student. So he was going into education when in his last year in undergraduate he got a study abroad scholarship to attend Bo Boise? Boise. Boise. Boise State University in Idaho, USA, which being on the western side of the states is home to a large vast diaspora um, community and he was very surprised to see the strong cultural attachment there to the homeland as well as the efforts to maintain or reobtain uh, to maintain or reobtain their heritage so after that he got involved in many pro basque pro basque revitalization initiatives in his hometown gastier gastis gastis he started researching and publishing <coughs> academic articles and came here to study the ma language support and revitalization um, so yeah so the talk, I can't believe how it's changed, oral testimonies on Basque in Vitore Gastes from Basque-speaking Igrid's perspectives. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Uh, first of all, thank you. This is great for me. This is very unique. I didn't even imagine to come here to, to talk. And, well, as you know, I had a wonderful experience last year. And, I don't know, it's kind of a, a way to, to, to close the circle. And I have to apologize as well because I was supposed to come with my nice shirt, my... Uh, nice trousers, but well, <laughs> before being a researcher, I was an activist, and uh, t today is a sad day. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, this, this newspaper was, was set up. Uh, it was the first grassroots um, um, bottom-up uh, newspaper only in Basque, and, and 10 years ago, they, they shut it down due to alleged links with, um, with terrorism. Uh, these links have been proved uh, false, um, many of the journalists were taken to prison. Uh, members of the uh, of the board were imprisoned and tortured, and and still um, they haven't received any compensation, even even moral compensation. And luckily, we have another newspaper now, but we, they still need to to pay the debt of the previous newspaper. And still, the political consequences are are obvious. So sorry for for this introduction as well but I thought it was a, a good opportunity. Um, so my, my hometown is Vitoria Gasteiz, in Basque is Gasteiz. Um, it's really important to, to talk about migrants because it was the city with the largest relative population growth uh, from the 50s to the 70s. Uh, so well, we will get into detail. So this is my city 50 years ago, um, yeah, 50 years ago, and this is nowadays. So it has changed quite a bit. Uh, of course, you are more than welcome, and you can visit me anytime. <laughs> uh, this is the outline. Uh, first of all, introduction, the origin of this work, the theoretical framework, methodology, results, uh, conclusion, references, and bonus slides, a small present for especially future researchers. Uh, I'm not a researcher, but I'm, I'm beginning, and I would like to share my, my experience. To warm up, um, who are we, where are we, where do we come from? Does anyone know anything about the Basque Country? Please, um, Julia, go ahead. <laughs> you, you can share it. Where is it, at least? It's in cross-border Spain, France. OK. Um, how many inhabitants, more or less? No, <laughs> um, what else? Um, do we have any, any language over there? <laughs> what's, what's the name? <laughs> there you go. Uh, um, what's so special? Oh, I didn't hear. Sorry. Uh, what's so special about about the language? It's a little There you go. Help yourself. I know it's after lunch time, so you might be a little bit hungry. There you go. Cheers. Uh, yeah. And, for example, do you know how many speakers, more or less? No? Hmm? Mm. <laughs> try, try later. Um, any other try? 200,000? No. No, okay. I will need one later for me. Um, what else? Um, one million speakers right now. That is um, one third of the total population of the Basque country. Um, any words that you know um, in Basque? <laughs> okay. 
Anything else? Topa. Topa, okay. There you go. What's Topa? Cheers. And what is Caricasco? Thank you. Well, I'm running out of... <laughs> any, any more words? Chaparral. Huh? Chaparral. Chaparral? So, means what? Um, Chaparral in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have chaparradas, so I was, I was testing you. Huh? Hatecha, okay. <laughs> Barely, but there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, does anyone know uh, the political distribution of the Basque Country, more or less? So um, these three provinces uh, belong to France nowadays, and these other four belong to to Spain. Uh, these three are the uh, communities autonomy of, of, uh, of the Basque country, the BAC, and this one is Nafarroa. Here, Basque is co-official. Here, Basque is co-official only in the north, and here it's not official. And the, uh, um, the status of the language is closely related to the situation of the language. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions I had for, for now. Um, so... This is new. OK. Um, so uh, for example, if, if we want to describe the champion in Basque, the, the word is chapeldun. Chapela is the beret, the hat. And, and if, you win a champ if you win a championship, you are given a beret. So uh, in order to call the champion, we said the one who has the beret. So that's, that's chapeldun. And can you guess what's the, say, what's the rule for Euskara? So the one who has Euskara? Euskara, <laughs> mm, it's, it's a bit trickier, but Robi. <laughs> Euskaldun, it's Euskaldun. So for example, um, the Basque country is, mm, I don't know. So the, the Basque country is called Euskal Herria. That is the land of the Basque language. And for example, uh, Euskaldun, so um, 150 years ago, we didn't have any language shift. So everyone was monolingual, right? So every single uh, individual from the Basque country was called Euskaldun, because being a Basque speaker and being from the Basque country meant the same. Nowadays, it's not the same. So we are starting to switch the, the definitions. So you might be Euskal Herritarra, which means citizen of the Basque country, but you may not be Euskaldun, which is Basque speaker. But the nice thing about this thing, about the, this definition, is that, uh, for example, um, Kifa can come to the Basque country, learn Basque, and she is automatically labeled as Euskaldun. So, so I don't know if it's in purpose or not, but it's a open, I don't know, open project or open family or whatever you want to call it. So you all can be Euskaldun if you want to. And then we have uh, two distinctions. Euskaldun Berria, which is new speaker, and Euskaldun Sarra, old speaker. And um, well, sadly, um, Euskaldun Sarra were too, too, too valued. Um, if, if you were a, a native speaker, you were the best one, whereas if you were a new speaker, you were a second level um, speaker. But then that's changing again. So I would like to talk about Aochak.com. Um, is anyone involved in language landscape here? Okay, so it's, it's pretty similar, although it has one different um, feature. So as some of you may know, the Spanish Civil War and the 40 years long uh, Franco regime was a very bloody period for everyone, for left-wing activists, for LGTB, for minority languages, for nations within Spain. And later on, the so-called democracy was non-existent and a remarkable need to document past crimes. Um, many of the crimes were unresolved, uh, for example, the first political party nowadays are the um, ancest well, uh, ancestors of, of, of the Franco regime, uh, the successors of Franco regime. So you can see that we didn't have a social justice together. So Aochak.com was born to record as many elderly people in the Basque country in order to, one, describe the horror of Franco regime, and two, document Basque linguistic diversity. Um, even though we are one million, we have seven dialects, and these dialects are um, distinguished in, in several sub-dialects, which, which is quite diverse, but uh, unfortunately due to our uh, standard, the eruption of our standard, 
um, we are suffering from dialectal leveling. And for example, Auchak.com has been in 300 villages, uh, 5,000 speakers, and more than 30,000 videos. And I wanted to volunteer, so that's why I, I started um, doing this, this work, just uh, interviewing these people. Two important details uh, about the origin of this work. I was in a forum in a premiere of a book, and one acquaintance of mine, he was sharing his experience, and he said, in, I work in, in a social service of, of my city, in a public service, and once uh, an, elder, uh, an elder person came to me and started speaking, but I realized that he was a Basque speaker, so I switched, and he admitted that it was in 50 years the first time that he used Basque uh, in, a, in a public service. And the other one, um, as some of you may know, I, I work as a physical trainer with seniors in, in the city council, and the vast majority are Spanish immigrants, and only a few, so far 12 out of 630, are Basque speakers. So it was really interesting because I had um, a little bit of two words, but obviously the Basque world was, was really small. Uh, my concern was that most of the work uh, was focused on, on the Spanish immigrants, uh, a lot of interviews, a lot of sociologic uh, works, and Vitoria Gasteiz, Gasteiz in Basque, uh, was and is a predominantly Spanish-speaking city. How did they feel, those Basque migrants, when they settled down in my city, and how do they feel now that Basque is um, going, going up? Um, this work is not to criticize any group of people in particular, of course, I'm not against anyone. And I have to be careful, especially back home, because they say, oh, you are an, you are an ethnicist, you want to get rid of Spanish migrants, and, and just, it's not true. But I just want to provide more evidence to describe the current vitality of Basque and try to understand why our language shift uh, happened. And then, as well, I want to contribute to Memoria Historica and Common Ground. And this is the end of, of my introduction in, in, my, in my article. I, I published this article two years ago, one year and a half ago, um, I, I applied for an award for young researchers. I won that one, and then I realized, well, I want to do something at SOAS. And right three months before coming to SOAS, I said, okay, I need to test myself, and, and that's why I, I published this article as well. And I finished saying, so if we haven't achieved to talk to you in Basque, I, I bet we can do so with your kids or grandchildren. It sounds kind of a threat, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't my, my intention. Well, this is the theoretical framework. Uh, a little bit of perception, language attitudes, vital event, the Basque country dictatorship, um, evolution, um, my city in particular, um, um, the language, and finally, immigrants and language rights. So, does anyone know what vital events are? I have five more. <laughs> so, um, apparently, if, if something happens to you, well, you, you can have two options. It can mean nothing to you, and the other option is to have a, a really deep consequence, a really deep uh, influence in you, right? So, for example, if, if we meet, uh, if Jeremy Corbyn comes here and says, oh, you are going to be the next leaders of England, if you like Jeremy Corbyn, um, you'll say, okay, okay, oh, what a man, what a man. But, and that could be a vital event, right? Um, and then perceptions, when human beings need to categorize information, need to explain what's, what's happening around, and for that reason, they need to uh, obtain information. The process of, of uh, obtaining that information is called perception, but as you know, it's really subjective, and vital events and perceptions are strongly related and are both of them really, really subjective. Um, so a little bit about the Basque country at that time. Um, in 1936, we already had a uh, language shift. Our language was declining, but the constitution from 1936 was pretty innovative for, for that time. Um, bilingualism was promoted. Um, t territorial rights and individual rights were uh, awarded for, for speakers. Um, they declared Basque as an autochthonous language, but in that very year, the coup d'etat stopped that, and the, the dictatorship was very repressive. They achieved the so-called quadruple homogenization, that is cultural, economical, political, and historical. Uh, there's one saying in, in Spanish coming from that period, Spain is one and not 51. 51 are the number of, of provinces in Spain, and by saying so, they mean that Spain needs to be 
one and only one. And the population of the, of the Basque country increased considerably at that time. So, for example, in 1851, uh, we were less than 900,000 uh, inhabitants, half in the back, where I'm from. Uh, nowadays, millions, and back has half of it. Reasons to grow. Spain at that time, um, Franco allied with the U.S., so they, t they turned from an isolated economy into a capitalist country, so they started producing goods for, uh, for the U.S., so um, national planners had to choose some, some places to build industries, and they needed people, so they, they took people from rural southern areas, and they took them especially to, the, to Great Catalonia and Basque Country. And a lot of authors think, well, was it a mere coincidence? You have to, think, uh, you have to take into account that Catalonia and Basque Country were the regions with the uh, most advanced, um, I don't know, willingness or desire to become independent countries. And all of a sudden, um, something related to demographic something happened. In purpose, I don't know. I don't have any evidence, but it can be, why not? Um, and for example, the three cities of the back, they were Bilbo was industrial, Donosti was touristic, and Gasteiz was rural, and nowadays they are similar now. For example, uh, at this point, the Basque culture, language, and existence as a nation was at risk. And for example, let's look at this uh, demographical uh, data. 43% uh, of, uh, of the Basque couples were locals, 25% mixed, and 32% outsiders. You have to take into account the, that the locals were already stopping to transmit their language. The mixed didn't transmit anything, and the outsiders have just Spanish. And even the birth rate, we are one of the... Um, how do you say? The regions with the smallest, with the shortest uh, birth rate in Europe nowadays, and the same was um, 50 years ago. So 1.2 for the locals and 2.1 for, uh, for the outsiders. Uh, and as I said, it was the city with the biggest relative population growth in, in Europe at that time. And, and Gonzalo de Langarica called him the revolutionized city because it used to be the city of priests, army officers, and peasants, and all of a sudden that changed. And there were three key factors for that. The first one was industrialization. But in order to um, have factories working, you needed people, so immigration. And in order to have people living and working, they needed urbanization. And this was um, an, an idea of the local elite. Um, as some of you may know, they, they killed um, previous, previous um, uh, presidents and, and councillors, especially if they were left wing. So the the local elite, the right-wing elite, um, took control of the, of the government and they designed an economical plan to develop the area and what a coincidence to, to get rich. So Gasteiz in 1950, 50,000 inhabitants. In just 20 years, 25 years, 2,000 new companies set up. And in 1975, um, we had 173,000 uh, inhabitants. 1,000 inhabitants. And so, for example, how did migrants integrate? Araba is my province, um, somewhat over here. They, were, they didn't have any problem because they had to go to, to the city at least once a week to, to sell their goods in the market, to buy stuff, to go to the government to do some paperwork. So they didn't have any problem. Rest of the Basque country, according to uh, Gonzalo de Langarica, they didn't have any problem. Culturally, were similar. And he said that um, the distinctive feature in some cases was the Basque language. And he said that the Basque language wasn't any, any reason to, to be discriminated. And I already knew that some Basque speakers had discrimination cases. So I said, mm, you're wrong, man. <laughs> so sick. And, and then uh, Rioja and Castilla, again, were similar to Araba. And southern Spain and Galicia were culturally the opposite. And they really had, sadly, discrimination cases. And I don't know why they were called Koreans. So in the Basque country, uh, Southerns and Galicians were called Koreans. Uh, and I don't know why. And they were uh, a two-way uh, clash between both of the, of the groups. Life in those years, gentrification. For example, in the neighborhoods of Abechuco and Recalor, uh, they had over 60% of the population came from Spain. They had some cohabitation problems at that time, no time for leisure and culture. They were functional neighborhoods, just work, work, 
uh, small houses, really, really poor houses. Um, maybe if you were lucky, a uh, small shop in, in your neighborhood. And eventually, local bus culture evolved, but just dances and just the habit that we have every single weekend to go to a bar, drink one wine, go to another one, drink one wine with your group of friends. And that's, that's about it, about local bus culture. Language wasn't part of it. When everything looked very dramatical, in the 50s, just less than 2,000 2, speakers in the province, an explosion of a pro Euskara movement. And nowadays, we are around 80,000 80, speakers in, in the province. We are, um, if we take into account the whole Basque country, the, the territory with the, with the biggest gro growth. So it's, it's a reason to be proud, I, I guess. Um, in Gasteiz, I'm sorry for being too colloquial, Spanish is the king. 22% uh, Basque speaking bilinguals, 26% pas passive, uh, passive bilinguals, and 44%, 54% uh, uh, monolinguals or speakers of other languages, which are estimated to be 10%. Basque is the mother tongue of merely 3.6%, and Spanish is always spoken by 83.1%. Um, every five years, we, we, they measure um, the conversations being held in, in the Basque country, and they calculated that the conversations held in Basque in my city were 0.9%, uh, where uh, foreign languages uh, made up up to 1.3%. So uh, foreign languages are more spoken than, than Basque. So, and some notes on, on immigration. Immigration is an, is an individual event, but affects everyone. And we realized, or some authors realized, that if we want to convince a migrant, we need to be welcoming, and we need to, be, we need to convince them that Basque is good for them, and we need to understand them as, as people, and they have their rights, they have their needs. So if, if it's not both ways, we, we, we won't succeed. And a good question is, how can we combine Basque revitalization with the language rights of the immigrant? And that is the, that is the key factor. Qualitative. Uh, the methodology was qualitative, oral testimonies, the method to provide voice to those who were silenced or did not speak up. Um, we, I, I wanted to know their, their perspectives on, on this period. And I wanted to analyze the perceptions, vital events, and language attitudes. Corpus, uh, nine interviewees, seven gave their permission to publish the videos. Uh, one of them, she lost her Basque because she was, um, her mother-in-law prohibited uh, her to use Basque at home, so, so she couldn't transmit it, so she, she lost her language. And the other one, she was too concerned with, with her image and he, she didn't give me her permission. Uh, mother tongue Basque, to all of them, born in very Basque speaking towns, and came to Gasteiz between 1950 and 1975, except two who came in 1980. Um, these are eight of my, of my interviewees. Pachi and Vittori uh, from Leizarraga, uh, Felisa, Marichu, um, Carmele, Chomin, Anchon, and Arancha. And all of them, they speak different dialects, and I will try to play the videos later on so you can um, at least experience. And I called them two months ago to see how were they doing, and sadly, she's uh, losing her, her mind. She, she doesn't answer anymore, and she doesn't know where she is, but the rest are doing, are doing fine. I saw him in the States. I, I went this summer to the States to the Basque Festival, uh, held in Boise every five years, and he, he started shouting, and, and he was there. So that was, that was very nice. And he's 81, although he doesn't look 81. So, um, uh, Kifa will know more than me, but in, in Ireland they have the Galtag. And we do have something similar, although they don't have any, any legal protection. Um, it, as you can see, the, the darker it gets, the, the more Basque speaking towns they are. So, these ones are part of the confederation of Basque speaking towns. Um, these little starts. Um, are the, the hometowns of, of, of my interviewees. Um, and when my, my father is from here, he, he didn't speak any Basque, and my mom is from here, so she, she was born in a very Basque environment. So yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a son of, of Basque migrants as well. Um, I designed an orientative outline with open questions 
Um, my intention, my intention was to know more about their childhood memories, first years in Gasteiz, discrimination and relationship with Spaniards, discrimination both ways, I, I, um, transmission of the language, lifestyle and language habitus and uh, language attitudes, Basque nowadays in Gasteiz, and challenges for the future. And these are the results. Most of them lived in Basque, except for school, doctors, and interaction with, with Spanish immigrants. Almost all of them had, uh, were punished for speaking Basque, and that was a, an important factor to stop the, the transmission and, and had a an stigmatized view of their language. They had overall good relationship with other Spaniards, and Chomi Nascoitia, for example, he said that we should be ashamed as Basque people because we, in some cases, we made them learn, learn Basque and we weren't really nice to them. So we, we have, in, in this work, I found a little bit of everything. And being bi bilingual was weird. First years in Gasteiz, um, tough lifestyle, work, work, and work, um, up to easily uh, 13, 14 hours per day working. Um, Opportunities to use Basque, depending on your motivation, context, and family. And uh, many times when you jumped into a Basque speaker, you may don't understand him or her because uh, the dialects were really different. And it was a pretty hostile city for everyone, not only for Basques. And for example, Anjona and Arancha asked them, was it the capital of the Basque country back then? Euskal Herria, the, the land of the Basque language. And no, it was Castilla Herria, the land, the land of, of Castilian. Um, overall, a uh, good relationship with Spaniards, as I said, even though many discrimination cases, one married an enemy of Basque, some, uh, sometimes speaking Basque uh, publicly was problematic. A lot of times they were linked to, to ETA, and, and some of them they had some regrets about their um, language attitudes and um, behavior, and the Basque speakers were a weak minority. And for example, I asked I ask Felisa, um, but why, why shouldn't we try to revitalize our language? And she, she answered, I don't like radicalisms. I don't give any importance to those matters. Of course, she, she didn't transmit the language to, to her daughter. And for example, uh, Anjona and Arancha, they, they had death threats for speaking Basque to the baker. The butcher, also a Basque speaker, replied in Spanish whenever other Spanish speakers were around. Their son was arrested for speaking Basque with his friends. Troubles in his job, in, in the case of Anjon for being a Basque speaker, but you have to take into account that he has a very strong Basque accent when he, when he speaks Spanish. And Mila, as I said, um, her mother-in-law prohibited the use of Basque, and Chomi Nascoitia was called uh, the farmer, the peasant, the, the redneck. And I wanted to show you some, some clips. Um, I had some issues with Movie Maker, but I managed somehow to, to subtitle the, the conversations. These are Anjon, Anjon and Arancha from a town. It's a, it's a town close to my mother's hometown, just five kilometers. So this, this clip of five minutes is um, full of, of their experiences being, being discriminated. Um, Marichu 
uh, had no kids, uh, but she, she all the time would answer, if Muslims speak in Basque, why not everyone? Uh, apparently, uh, she is really shocked when, when she sees any, any immigrant speaking Basque. And all the time, he, uh, she was uh, telling me that. Um, and Tiona and Arancha, uh, they, were, they had some troubles trying to transmit the language, because at that time, uh, there wasn't any, any Basque school. So their kids uh, started losing the language. But they said that they are Basque speakers now. And this is really interesting, this point here. Um, one neighbor used to visit them uh, to, listen, uh, to listen to Basque. Um, um, the father of this, of this neighbor was a, a Guardia Civil, which is a very repressive uh, police force in, in Spain. And so he would sneak out the house at night and go to their home to listen to Basque and learn. And I was very impressed with, with this guy, but it happened that Carlos was my um, local mu uh, music teacher for many years. So I, I saw him later and said, oh, so you were the one sneaking out the house. And yeah, <laughs> so that was, that was really nice. And then Carmele, uh, her daughter, is a famous Basque writer. And her um, tales or, or um, books are, are taken to, to movies, and she's very successful. But she said, my daughter is a famous Basque writer, but she speaks Spanish to her Basque-speaking husband. I don't get it. In her case, um, a lot of years suffering to teach, to teach her Basque, to uh, ask her, you have to speak Basque, you have to be Basque. And then whenever she has an easy chance to speak Basque, she, she, she speaks Spanish. Then Chomin, all my kids and grandkids have the EGA. EGA is a sort of TOEFL or uh, Cambridge certificate for the language. And for him, um, to transmit the language is to achieve the EGA, to get the EGA. And well, that's true. That's, that's, a good, that's a good thing. But for example, two of her grandkids are best friends with my girlfriend. And three of them, they, they speak Spanish between each other, even though their mother tongue is Basque. So, more. And then Vitori, Pachi, Feliz, and Mila, they didn't transmit the language. And now they, they regret that. And this is a fragment for, from Felisa. Let's see. No. Um. Hay viñaderas. Es que, mire, ¿va a venirse por? O que suena la antigua, ¿va a venirse por? Tiene que pensar, dice, antes, ese vez, ¿eh? Es que, esta, este va a chupar ese vez, ¿eh? Me dijo, oye, está aquí, no está bien. ¿Por qué no nos enseñaste tú? Porque no me salía, porque nadie no, el padre tampoco no tenía ni idea, la sécula. Mire, dice una vez. So that's it. Uh, as you may realize, she, she switches back and forth Spanish and Basque. And that's, that's common in, in, in my city, especially in my city. Uh, especially if, uh, as this lady, she, she doesn't speak any Basque at all, only with uh, uh, fellow villagers. If, if she finds anyone from Oñati, then she, she starts uh, speaking Basque. But if it's not from Oñati, you say, oh, no, no, that's not real Basque. So she refuses to speak Basque. Um, lifestyle and language habitats. Uh, overall, no efforts to speak Basque, except for Anjona and Arancha, who were the ones being discriminated. Hearing Basque is a joy for them. And stereotypes, she looked Spanish, but when she replied to asking in Basque, what a surprise. And that happened to, for example, my, my grandfather. He, he was doing the military service in Logroño in Spain, and they saw a girl, and they started, oh, she's so nice, oh, she's so attractive, oh, we should have uh, tried to uh, tease her. And then all of a sudden, um, the girl uh, make a turn, and she said, okay, uh, can you stop that? I'm Basque, although I, I don't look Basque. So it's, it's common in the Basque country. And bad manners, for example, if, uh, I don't know in, in other uh, regions, but, but in the Basque country, if you are surrounded by at least one other Spanish speaker who doesn't speak any Basque, it's uh, very impolite, very rude to, to speak Basque. So that's why a lot of conversations uh, are switched to, to Spanish, because there's one, one Spanish speaker. Um, we can argue that being monolingual is, is a bargain, in, at least in the Basque country. Um, Basque nowadays in Gasteiz. Uh, this is the, the, the quote that gave the, the name to the title. Uh, reasons for that, Icastolas, uh, that is the Basque Immersion Schools, they, they started being uh, illegal. Uh, they were hiding from Franco. 
they managed to survive and now they are integrated into the public system. Then the Basque government had a, a huge role in this, but now as, as Julia argues a lot of times, there's a risk to uh, give, the, give the role, give the, um, the, I mean, the responsibility to the government and forget about uh, language activism of grassroots initiatives. Um, Basque speaking migrants did a, a lot of work to maintain the language. There's freedom now. We have to take into account that Basque was forbidden for more than four centuries. And now appearance is not enough to determine whether that person is a Basque speaker or not. And that's good and that's bad. Because if you jump into Robbie and you say, mm, is he Basque? So the easiest thing to do is to speak Spanish. But perhaps he speaks Basque. Um, Marichu from Aguiña, uh, she, she said, Oren carrera tralite que euskaras está. You can even get a degree at university in Basque now, right? This is very, very special for them, very unique. Um, and then she said, Basque reminds me waking up when I was a kid, when mom was breastfeeding all my siblings, my first husband, my childhood memories. Um, she has a really unique, sadish story. Um, she fell in love with the priest of, of her hometown, but at that time that was forbidden, that was very, uh, I don't know, it was very sacred to do that. So they ran away to Gasteiz, and in three years the husband died. Yeah, so she was lonely uh, for, uh, by herself for 10 years, and then she married uh, an enemy of Basque, and she wasn't, um, she wasn't very good to her, and, and she, in the interview, she was always referring to, to her first uh, husband. And her first husband was a, a very distinguished figure in, in Basque revitalization, so it's, it's very sad. Um, and then again, um, this, this dialect is better than the other one, language purism, a lot of language uh, ideologies going on here as well. Um, Arancha Nanchon from a town. Um, what is Basque for you? We have nothing else, and we don't want to get rid of it. Uh, Basque, is, Basque is not suitable outside the Euskal Herria, but it is the local language, and older than Spanish indeed. So if, if it's older than Spanish, it's better. Um, well, that's, that's an argument. Uh, whoever lives here should try and learn it. Look at that kid. He's black, he's black and speaks Basque perfectly. So again, uh, some prejudices, stereotypes. But I guess we are very... Very, I uh, know, uh, very moved when we see uh, migrants speaking Basque, and I think we are very thankful for that. And Spaniards should regret not speaking it. And I have another uh, clip here. This was with Movie Maker. <laughs> oh. They were very, this couple was very lovely. During the interview, they were f fighting between each other all the time and shut up and it was, it was really fun. Uh, I think I shared this, um, this situation with you uh, last, last semester, but when I was um, giving a, a lecture on, I work with a false prevention program, so I was um, giving some uh, advices to, to uh, uh, prevent falls uh, for senior people. And I, I finished my slide saying thank you in Basque, and one, one guy started, um, what is that? Es que asco. And I said, don't you know that? Uh, no, uh, it's, it's thank you in Basque. And he was living in the Basque country for 50 years, and he didn't even know how to say um, thank you in, in Basque. But uh, I mean, uh, why? Many reasons, because maybe Basque people didn't uh, succeed um, getting close to him, or maybe 
he, he thought we were too radical, too terrorist, I don't know, a, a lot of reasons. I, I can only speculate. Um, Pachi uh, and Vittori from Lizarraga, they said, uh, Spanish was learned by and brought to us later, uh, remarking that, that it's a language that was imposed uh, by, by military conquests. And it is said that Basque is a difficult language, and, but it's also said that if you learn other languages, then, then it's easier to learn Euskara. And then I feel butterflies in my stomach when, uh, when I hear it. And Carmele from Lequetio, it should be promoted, it's our language, they have not tried to learn it, but we have not tried to make them learn either. And then she mentioned discrimination and Aneta many times. And since we are talking about Carmele, this other video. No. This one. I, I asked her if, if she considered at least once to send her kids to a Spanish school, and she said that no, that that would have mean that uh, their kids wouldn't wouldn't learn any any Basque. I'm realizing that I'm <laughs> I'm going too fast. Um, if you have any question right now, you can ask. You can interrupt me whenever you want. Hmm. Yeah, but it's what time is it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I was calculating that I I, I began at at, at four and like. Really, t uh, 15 minutes only. <laughs> I was <laughs> so fast. I did my rehearsals at home, and they were like one hour. And <laughs> OK, um, let's continue. I asked him, uh, I asked Chomin, um, is Basque important for you? And he replied, important, 10 out of 10. And look at these important erudite people, Basque speakers, all of them. And he mentioned um, an artist, a footballer, um, and so on, and actually none of them could speak any Basque. But, I uh, know, he, he thought they were Basque speakers, but I don't know. Um, it's the language of our grandparents, and we can't leave it like that. Um, Spanish arts hate us now, because our obligation to learn Basque, and, and they are right, and then it won't disappear. Felisa Oñati, uh, is it a language, talking about Basque? I was like, yeah, maybe. Um, we need a common ground. It shouldn't be compulsory. If you speak it, good. If not, get over it. Um, Mila from Ochandio, the one that uh, lost her Basque. It shouldn't be compulsory. It should be speaking, uh, spoken. But being Spanish, the most important language of the world. Well, these, these are very um, recurrent uh, topics in, in language ideologies in Spain. So, so a lot of Basque people have, um, I don't know, eaten them or swallowed them or whatever. And they have it really, really inside them. Challenges for the future, speak and speak. Uh, eliminate the links between, between Basque and terrorism. Um, hopefully, um, this will be my topic for, I'm doing a master's now, and this will be the topic of, of my dissertation. I'm try to um, analyze or describe the linguistic conflict in the Basque country. Um, then, do what immigrants do with their languages. They always say that, Immigrant people are really proud of their languages. They are not afraid of sp speaking up. And you can go to, to, I don't know, to a supermarket and speak it loudly, whereas normally Basque people are more shy. Maybe we, are, we were stigmatized, so we are now concerned, and we, we are kind of ashamed. And Basque should be valued. That's what they said as well. Con that, uh, I will begin with the conclusions. Um, childhood memories in their hometown. Almost every parent could not speak any Spanish at all. Uh, if they could, that was a, a marked feature. Uh, doctors and teachers didn't know any Basque, and, and they, were, they were punishing people. And only Mila did not speak Basque at home. I subtitled another video, but I don't know why the subtitles are gone. I'm asking Chomin, um, which language did you speak at home? 
and he's saying, no, my, my parents could, sí, couldn't no. speak any, any, any Spanish, uh, just sí si and no. He's saying that um, in Ascoiti they had a train to go to the to the coast to the beach, and and in that in that train the Guardia Civil the the repressive police force was always on patrol. So they couldn't speak because if they were caught speaking Basque, they would punish them. And, and if, if uh, the Guardia Civil would ask something to, to, for example, his mom, she just could say sí and no, even though she didn't understand anything. I don't support monolingualism either, so <laughs> just to make sure. Um, more conclusions, first year in Gasteiz, they came to work or to come with their partner who, come, who came to work. No time to show, socialize at the beginning, um, little Basque spoken, even when Basques were around, and different exposure to the language at that time. If you were working in a Basque immersion school, then you were lucky because your colleagues were Basque speakers and so on, and that exposure uh, influenced their life. Um, discrimination and relationship with Spaniards, um, that left a scar on them, definitely. Some of them did not transmit the language. Some of them, they were, um, Arancha and Anchon, they admitted that they, they felt hatred against Spaniards because they were discriminated. Luckily, nowadays, they, they are friends with, with everyone. Uh, they even hang out with a lady who uh, told them to, to speak in Christian, otherwise um, she will kill them. Um, no interaction at the beginning between both groups. Nowadays, everything is quite mixed. And Basque had weak support because of politics. Transmission of the language. This is qualitative, but just to give, uh, give you an example, 50% uh, of them uh, did transmit it. Social norms. Uh, so I guess politics influenced that decision. And again, they are amazed with immigrants speaking Basque. And so, if immigrants speak it, must, must not be that hard. That's another language ideology from Spain. They said that Basque is the most difficult language of the world, which is really, I don't know, let's say it that way. And so a lot of people say, no, why am I going to learn Basque if it's so difficult? It's pointless. Um, lifestyle, uh, most of their day, interactions in Spanish. Some make an effort to speak Euskera. Happiness when they hear conversations in Basque or they jump into a Basque speaker. First word, uh, always in Spanish. So for example, every time I call them, they, they, they reply, si, sí, dígame, that is in Spanish, hello, tell me, instead of, vaya san. Uh, lonely love, lifestyles, uh, some of them, so they don't interact with Basque speakers or less uh, Spanish speakers. And some did nothing to keep the language, and now they are ashamed because of that. Language attitudes, two types, indifferent or very supportive. When I ask them, should we have a more brave uh, language planning and policy? They say, no, no, that is radicalism. Um, but they say, we should do something for our language, which is a cultural treasure, and it's part of our national identity as well. Basque nowadays in Gasteiz, um, the improvement from the 70s is unbelievable, thanks to the government and the Castolas. Every social group is united now, supporting the language. That's what they say, but the truth is that two main, main parties are uh, pretty much against the language. Um, Non-Basque speaking grandparents get happy when their grandkid speaks Basque in front of them. You have to take into account that 70% of, of schools in my city are Basque immersion schools nowadays. So that's, that's an asset, definitely it's an asset. But there's much to do. Um, for example, Basque standard versus dialect. A lot of speakers of dialects, they, uh, they reject uh, the, the standard. And they say that's an artificial language, that's the language of the young people. And, and this is another interesting fragment, again, from, uh, from Felisa. She, she's really nice. She's 89, by the way. 
Belisa. Sala? Abis na siya sa tiyo. Apeli mo yun. Apeli mo. Apeli mo. Warke. Diga rin na Martinez. De Suazo. Suazo buka siya. Pinti ba niya Suazo ha? So, um, I tried to accommodate to her dialect, and, but I didn't know how to say um, last name in, in her dialect. And when I said Avicena, which is the standard, uh, what is that? And all the time he couldn't un she couldn't understand any of my words. Like, ah, your standard. It's, it's, I can't understand it. I, um, my mom speaks... Um, the dialect of Anjon and Arancha, so it was much easier to do the interview with them. Challenges for the future, forget politics, make the language compulsory, that's what Felisa said. <laughs> like, really, that's, that's what you want to do? And then support the language, no shame to speak it, it should be valued, the awareness of being Basque, uh, focus on children and youth, and improve the standard, make it ours. And, well, before I, I start with my statement, another quote. So he's complaining because he, he can speak Basque to, to the Ertanias, but, but did he make any effort to speak Basque to the Ertania? I, I don't think so. So that's a bit tricky. Mm -hmm. what, what would be the reaction, though, if, if they speak to you in Spanish and you reply in Basque? Would they think it's not difficult? Or uh, this, or? To be honest, there are a lot of people uh, being taken to the police, how do you say? Uh, police station just because you speak Basque to them. Um, it's kind of understandable if, if the other police is the Spanish police, even though that's illegal and that's against your rights. But even the Basque police gets really angry, gets really aggressive, and they can take you to the police station. So, yeah, it's that. <laughs> I don't know. That domain is, is not a domain of, of the Basque language so far. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, um, that's what a lot of people think, that if, if I speak Basque, I'm a, a terrorist, um, maximum, or at least I'm a, I support the left-wing uh, pro-independence party of, of, of the Basque country. But th that's not true because we have a lot of people speaking Basque. They can be right-wing, left-wing, um, whatever. But that's, that's, what, uh, that's the image of, uh, that they have about Basque. And, and, and it's sad, and now that ETA um, has ceased the fire, we are hoping that that situation will change, although the other side doesn't do much about, about the language as well, so I don't know. It's slippery, as always. Um, so general statements, and that's uh, uh, my personal view based on this work. It was a very meaningful period to analyze. The city was growing. It was the middle at the end of the dictatorship. Basque revitalization efforts were emerging. It was the first experience outside the hometown of my interviewees and the first contact with Spanish immigrants in a lot of times. As you may know, um, as, as you realized, I had a very limited corpus, very different testimonies, 
Some maintain the language, some others not. Um, I read once that uh, linguistic anomy is to feel foreigner in your own linguistic community. And that's what happens a lot of times, and, and sometimes it, it happens the same to me. Like, for example, when I was playing um, football when I was a kid, uh, another kid came and speak speak Christian, this is Spain, please speak Christian. Stop, stop being rude. <laughs> okay. It happens a lot, um, I, uh, unfortunately. Um, more general statements. Uh, it was really important, the role of activists and the Basque government. A new period is coming now. Uh, Basque, after decades um, increasing the knowledge and the use, is uh, the reversal of that language shift is stopped now, or it's even declining again. So we are a bit worried. Um, Basque activists are uh, concerned, are uh, having a lot of meetings, trying to um, design another um, strategic plan or whatever. Um, what to do with the others? Two different views. We were bad to them, but at the same time, they discriminated us. So uh, what's the middle ground? What should we do? What, how should we address this, this matter? Um, Basque stubbornness, good and bad. We, I don't know, they say that we are very stubborn. And that's good because we maintain the language uh, thanks to that. But for example, that's bad because we couldn't come up with another approach to the migrants. And we were really strict to the neo speakers. And we were really strict uh, to the standard and the dialect. For example, my father is a neo speaker. And my brother and I always, we give him a, a bad time because he makes a lot of mistakes. But um, we shouldn't do that. We should appreciate his, his effort. And this year, um, so December the 3rd is the day, the International Day of the Basque Language. And, and this year, um, it was dedicated to all neo speakers in the world. So that was, that was nice. Um, they, they invited me um, to, to write an article in a, in, in a local newspaper. And I dedicated it to, to my father. So I guess now we are OK. <laughs> and these are my references. I'm finishing now. Uh, bonus slides, as I promised. <laughs> How to publish your first real article. Real, if you can say real. Because I had a lot of uh, mistakes. Uh, a lot of lacunae, I realized. But it was a, a, a great lesson. I, I learned a lot. Topic, it was a very familiar context um, because I worked with them. Corpus, right there, I used to do a physical exercise twice a week with them. So I just needed to ask, do you want me to ask you a couple of questions? And although a couple of questions turned into, into one hour and a half, two hours conversation. And then it was a lot of work to transcribe everything. And it was fun. Uh, how to get the information? We have a huge uh, library. It's called Fundación Sancho El Sabio. Everything on Basque language and culture. And it's a pleasure to work there. The atmosphere is really nice, really inspiring. Um, then the material resources, Aochak.com lent me their camera, their lights, um, their um, sof software. And it was really heavy. And my city is growing. So I had to ride my bike everywhere. So I was riding my bike and my huge bag. And I would arrive to, to the house sweating. And it was fun. I spent one month and a half working on this. I finished in July 15th. 2014. Um, problems. I had a lot of problems with this article. I had previously published in one journal, but they had a two-year limitation for authors. So I didn't know any other journal. So Iñaki Martínez de Luna, who is a really distinguished speaker in Basque social linguistics, he invited me to send the article to his uh, journal. But they have, they have a 40,000 character limit. And my article was over 100,000. So <laughs> that was a, a huge mistake of mine. And somehow I managed to cut it down. I sent it in September, no news until mid-November. So I wrote to them again. It got approved. And then a lot of revisions, months and weeks and weeks of revisions. This statement is false. Be careful and change it. But I was pretty sure that, that it, it was true. But anyway, I changed it. Um, in December, I, it got accepted. Yay, we will publish shortly. So February 2015, um, this guy. Kika Munari is my favorite figure in Basque social linguistics. He tweets the content of, uh, of the article, of the journal, and my article is not there. And so I freak out. I, I write to the director of the journal, and, and she seriously tells me, 
Uh, please don't be so impatient. Uh, yours was going to be published in April, so please, you need to be calm. We're like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, so before April, they asked me for another revision. I was like, one more. And, and I was here at SOA, so I was really busy. And finally, April 2015, my article is out there, but Kika Wenarrit doesn't tweet it this time. When I needed propaganda, he, and he doesn't tweet it, so I freak out again. Um, one month ago, he came to, to, to my city to give a lecture, and he uh, takes the issue. He opens my article, and he says, well, you should read his article. Benyad Garayo, he's right there. So I get really embarrassed. I turn red. <laughs> I, my, my, I, I stop breathing. <laughs> it, was, it was horrible. And what am I doing right now? It's a Diñaminto. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to work there. It's a... Um, um, a seminar on minority languages. So every month we, we invite a minority language speaker. The first day he speaks or she speaks about, about that language, the socio social linguistic situation, the historical evolution, features. Uh, we, we learn some words and expressions. And, and next day we have a cultural concert. So, so far we had Galician, Nahuatl from El Salvador, the language of Ebony. Uh, Ebony recommend me a linguist that also could speak Basque. So, so we did that presentation in, in Nahuatl and Basque, which was pretty, pretty cool. Um, you should, he was about to come to the last Endangered Language Week, but, uh, but uh, he had some personal issues, so he withdrew his commitment. But he teaches uh, Galician, hypnotizing people. He went to Tibet, and he was trained there for one year. But he's a character, so if you have the chance, please invite him to Suas because he, he's really nice. Um, so this is Galician. This is Nawat with Alan King. He's, uh, he's English himself. And he's a member of the Basque uh, Academy of the Language. So I uploaded all the, all the videos. And this is uh, Galician with Isaac Shubin. And he's doing his PhD at, at Sheffield at the moment. And next month, we will have um, Welsh. Uh, we're inviting Patrick Carlin. He's Irish himself. He speaks Gaelic, but he also speaks Welsh, Catalan, Spanish, English, and Basque. So he will, we will do it in Basque as well. January, uh, Asturian. February, um, Tamasik. Uh, March, uh, Gascon. And April, uh, Kurdish. So we will have Birgul uh, over there. And next year, we are hoping to have many other languages, including Julia. Uh, so, yeah. So, this is Itzadiñaminto. It's really fun, although um, not many people showing up, around 15 per average, and that's a bit disappointing for me. But what, we, will, we will improve eventually. Um, perhaps in January, I've been offered to do the linguistic map of Gasteiz, so I need to start documenting how many languages are spoken in Gasteiz. Uh, which is going to be a lot of work. And then the International Mother Tongue's Day event in, in February. And bonus slides, and this is the end. If you like language planning and policy, political discourse analysis, linguistic nationalisms, language conflicts, language rights, code switching, <laughs> linguistic landscape, linguistic activism, then let's work together. This is my email. It's Carricasco. Many thanks. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. So, in, in the scenario you mentioned, where you might meet Robbie as a stranger and not know whether he speaks Basque or not, so you would use Spanish first. Huh? Has there been any kind of um, initiative, you know, to sort of visually identify yourself as someone who's either learning or fluent in and willing to speak the language? Because in, uh, I'm not sure how successful it's been, but I've seen with Irish there's been badge you can wear that says, you know, I speak a few words fluently. So, yeah. yeah, we have the badge, that's that one. And the other one is a um, radio campaign um, trying to support, uh, trying to, to realize that we should speak Basque first, and then if the other one doesn't speak 
Basque, we can switch to Spanish. So, but again, it's kind of hard because sometimes you get uh, bad answers or you get really, really nervous because I, um, what am I doing? What am I doing? And, and you, you do it in Spanish. So, but so, so far two, two initiatives. But I think it's, it's changing now. Um, you had another question, right? Yeah. Huh? They spoke um, Spanish to a Basque person. That was before the revitalization, is that right? Um, well, how is it now? I just want to know how is the situation now? Are people speaking, I mean, are they free to speak as even a Basque woman married to a Basque person? Am I right? Is it free? It's freely spoken now? Well, now it's free. Now it's not forbidden anymore. Okay. Um, the transmission of the language amongst uh, uh, both uh, both members of the of the couple speaking Basque is around 95 percent. If uh, one of the parents is Basque speaker, then the transmission is 86 percent. That's uh, that's the percentage so far. But in in the Basque autonomous community, in the two other regions, uh, the percentage is, is lower because it's it's not uh, an official language. It's stigmatized, especially in the French part. Mm. So you mentioned it. How about to um, no, um, it, it depends on the area. Uh, in my area, you can do everything in Basque. Um, high school, primary school, elementary school, uh, PhD. And in some other areas, for example, in, in Nafarroa, uh, I told you... Um, so, no. So here, uh, as I told you, this... The north is uh, Basque is official. Here is semi semi official, if you can call it that way, and here is non official. So if you want to learn the language here, you need to drive um, at least seventy kilometers to go to a to a Basque um, school. And here there are seven private schools, I think. So you need to drive to one of these, otherwise French or Spanish. I, I would personally love to uh, know what what are the future the features of a of a language activist. Uh, what I know is that um, a lot of people around me. If you are if you go to a meeting, you you speak in Basque in the meeting, but then you go to drink um, I don't know uh, a glass of wine, and then you switch your conversation and you start speaking in Spanish. So it's um, it's a contradiction, as as you said, and as I told you, it was yesterday I think. Uh, I was in a, we were part of a summer camp to teach Basque to kids and we had a kind of a meeting with all the teachers. Uh, every day we had a meeting and the coordinator of that, of that camp, he started the meeting in, in Spanish and he went to the same immersion school as I did and I said, no, no, <laughs> you have to do it in Basque, I think. So he switched it. So it's, it's pretty common, I guess. But it's changing. I think it's changing for the good. that there's a, a tension between revitalization and the, and the standard and then there's sort of dialectal leveling that happens. I wonder like what your thoughts are on how you can work revitalization efforts with 
the maintenance of diversity? Oh. <laughs> well, uh, I think Julia is a, a more <laughs> appropriate person to talk about that. For example, you can take the, the Corsican approach. At least you have to value all the, all the diversity that you have. And you cannot um, promote the standard at the expense of the dialects because it's, um, well, it's the same as language shift, just with your language. So why are you doing that? And now more people, and even more and more, are speaking their dialect in the TV. So the dialect is um, becoming more um, accepted or at least um, more visible. So at least that's, that's one of the uh, measures. Another one is school, of course. For example, my, my cousins, uh, they're in their hometown, 97% of them speak Basque. And in school, they learn standard for the first year. For first year. And I don't think that's a, that's a good approach to, to teach it. I think you have to go little by little. Their mother tongue is the dialect. And then, after five, some years, you can start with the, with the standard. That's my view, I don't know. Sure. Thank you. Is the standard uh, modeled on a particular dialect? Yeah. Um, so this is Gipuzkoa. Nowadays, this is the nucleus of the Basque country. Um, they are kind of arrogant nowadays. My mom is from here, but she speaks another dialect. The dialect um, the standard is based on is don, uh, the Donosti uh, subdialect, Donosti and Lapurdi dialect. So pretty much all the features that you can find in the standard can be can be found in this in this continuum. Yeah. Is it, is it this variety of majority or political? Or um, here, for example, in, in my province, 30% of, of uh, the population are Basque speakers. In this province, 70% of the population are Basque speakers. Um, most of the culture comes from here. Um, most of the politicians come from here. So we will say that it's the elite or the Gemoni class or province of, of the Basque country. Um, good question. Um, um, la so for December the 3rd, the International Day of, of the Basque Language, they launched a, a documentary of um, Basque being spoken outside, and they interviewed the mayor of Boise, who is Basque speaker himself. And uh, for many, many decades, he was the only mayor in the world who could speak any Basque. And that was, that was really, really interesting and, and really sad at the same time. Um, he could learn Basque, but just because he was uh, closely related to a, a Basque political family in the Basque country, the reality is that I don't know, many, few, few, very few families are transmitting the language. And even though there are some attempts to, to become a neo speaker of Basque, it's really hard to, to become a, a neo speaker, especially uh, in, in the States, having English, and as always. But there are some attempts, and, and we, as, as the Basque mainlanders, uh, we are valuing the diaspora members more and more, which is bringing us together. And I think, I think it's perfect. I think it's very lovely. Um, okay, let's. Let's go one by one. Um, they they love the language, but but they didn't transmit it. Um, they they lived in another Basque speaking town, so they have both of dialects. Their dialects are are mixed. So as I said, they love it, but they didn't transmit it. So half and a half. Felisa, no, um, she doesn't care at all. Um, Marichu, she loves it, but she's really shy. She, she hardly uh, gets out of the house, so she doesn't speak anymore. Um, her siblings are dying, and her siblings are the, the only Basque speakers she has. Uh, Carmele, she cares a lot. She was involved in, in the 
establish, establishment of, of the Basque, the first Basque immersion school. Chomin, well, I don't know, he's, he, he, likes to, he likes to live and he, he doesn't mind if it's in Basque, Spanish, his important thing is to, to drink the wine and, and enjoy the life. And, and these two, they, they care a lot. They, they, they did a lot of effort to, to transmit the language. Their, so, their sons had a, a very difficult um, environment to, to acquire the language, even though, uh, even, even so, they, they, they achieved the, their goal. And Mila, the one that is not here, and uh, now she has started caring, but maybe too late, um, although, although she's teaching, uh, she's speaking Basque to, to her gr granddaughter. So after 40 years without speaking none, um, she, she's, she's speaking again, although um, the teacher of, of her granddaughter told, told, told the granddaughter, did your grandmother uh, help you with the homework? Because I can tell this is a different dialect. Uh, come on. <laughs> so this is more or less. Um, so my first article, <laughs> this is a coincidence, I, it was on, on uh, immigrant uh, language attitudes, immigrants uh, outside, outside Spain. And I found that there are three types of, of, of language attitudes and it's based on, on their exposure to the language, depending on where did they live before, um, if they live in a Basque envi environment. So it can be either very against uh, indifferent and supportive. About the um, language use and language knowledge, I don't know. There are no, I mean, no meaningful differences, I would say. Just some of them, they acquire it, and, and that's it. No, not a big proportion. So yeah. they have uh, the same. Are, 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 are there No, there's there's no data on that, I think. But it it would be interesting to to analyze that. Mm. Um, just briefly going back to your video participants, you mentioned that some of them were happy to have the video shared online, some mm -hmm. of them weren't. I'm just wondering if if any of them gave a reason that was tied to language or the content of the video, or if it's just personal preference. Um. So Mila was the one who lost, lost the language. Um, when I called her at the beginning to approach, uh, approach her, I, I started speaking Basque because I, I knew that she could somehow um, have a conversation. And I said, uh, Mila, uh, I want to interview you. I'm like, oh, no, 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 I'm sick, I'm sick. No, 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 I'm sick. And then I called, I called her again, realizing that maybe she wanted to be interviewed in Spanish. And then she, she accepted. She, but again, since she didn't speak any, any Basque, I couldn't uh, upload my, my video in aochak.com. So it was, um, I don't know, not pointless, but it was extra, an extra work for me. So I, I didn't, um, I, I didn't uh, record her. And Carmele, it was just a, a, a public uh, personal concern. Uh, she has uh, some issues in, in her mouth, um, uh, her jaw is, I don't, know. I don't know, whatever. Uh, so she didn't want me to publish it because she would look to the public as she was having issues in the in the jaw and, and she was concerned about that. That's it. Is there uh, much opportunity for exchange between the French and Spanish side of the Basque country? In the sense that maybe people who would uh, have to use Basque to communicate. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, um, the interaction between both sides of the borders, uh, and that's not a coincidence, was um, more intense before the civil wars and the World War II. 
Um, after that, uh, the transmission stopped in, bo in both sides of the area, so they couldn't speak to each other in Basque. So they stopped um, crossing the, the border all the time. And initiatives right now, we have a lot of uh, fundraising events um, all over the provinces. So we, we go to one, next month we'll go to another province. And there's one association called um, Iparregua, which is north-south. And uh, every year they, they organize a huge event in Segura, close to my mother's hometown. And the, the, the objective is to um, introduce uh, one to each other's culture. And, but I will say that there are more and more uh, initiatives. And for example, um, two summers ago, I, this is Tuberoa. They speak a really, I don't know, weird dialect. That's, that's not correct, but let's say it that way. Uh, I know, I know. I'm going to hurt myself later. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's really distinct. It's, uh, it's really difficult to understand. So every, every month, every month, no, every summer, they have a two-week-long summer camp for the southerners so that we can learn their dialect. And, and it's, it's really nice. And I went there, and, and hopefully this summer I, I will go again. More questions? One more? Because I know, unfortunately, there's um, Benya has to shoot off. Yeah, my plane is at eight, so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can continue the discussion by email. Yeah, sure. Um, um, yeah, let's say thank you very much. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, please. Eat more. I have two questions. Uh, no, no, you can take one. <laughs>